very much. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. I appreciate you, appreciate you coming to listen to the talk today. You know, a few years ago, the president came to, North, uh, came to Kentucky. At the time I was working in Frankfurt, and a lot of news reports. And I thought, you know, it had been a few years since the president had been to the state, so I thought, I wonder how many times that has happened. And I uh, started looking into it, and there was virtually no research. Nobody done anything. <coughs> you know, the president coming is a pretty important event. And the more I, the more I uh, looked into it, uh, the more I found that I thought was interesting. Uh, there's history, obviously. Uh, there's a reason the president has come. Uh, there's people he met, and there's usually some kind of interesting story. I started putting all this together, and here's what I found out. The president had visited Kentucky about 130 times. A lot of times they just passed through. 27 presidents have visited Kentucky during while they were president. 18 of those have come to northern Kentucky. James Monroe was the very first president to visit. It's an 18, 19, we'll talk about that. Uh, Monroe and Jackson were the only presidents before the Civil War who visited Kentucky. But at that point, of course, transportation became much better. Presidents could visit much more, go further. Since the Civil War, there have only been three presidents that have not visited Kentucky. James A. Garfield, who was only president for a few months before he was assassinated. Um, Grover Cleveland, who served two terms, separate eight-year terms, or four-year terms. He didn't visit while he was president, and Calvin Coolidge did not. Now, each of those three visited Kentucky other times during their lives, but just not while they were president. But the very first person, first president who came to Northern Kentucky was James Monroe. Uh, you know, coming to Kentucky from, the, from Washington in the early 1800s, very difficult, very difficult journey, somewhat dangerous journey. <clears throat> So the first four presidents, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, did not come. And, and uh, in fact, neither of the four ever made, ever visited the state. But Monroe did. Um, now, I want you to imagine a time when the president leaves Washington for four and a half months. Uh, for much of that time, the folks in Washington really didn't know where he was. The only way to communicate with him was a horse, was a, a ride on a fast horse. Pony Express. Kind of like, kind of like the Pony Express. It was a, it's a horse, a horse. That's the only way to, only way to get a message to him. Um, he uh, left Washington March 30th on a steamboat, went down the coast to Savannah and Charleston, then went across uh, the wilds of South Carolina <clears throat> and Alabama. He eventually showed up in uh, Nashville, home of Andrew Jackson, where he met Jackson. Then he came up to Kentucky and made to Kentucky June the 15th. During much of that time, uh, nobody knew where he was. And in fact, in the newspapers in Washington, there were rumors that he had died. Uh, of course, there was no, uh, no advance team. He traveled with his nephew and his uh, private secretary, who eventually became his son-in-law. Uh, no security detail, and he was traveling at his own expense, as the government would provide no money for his travel. Uh, and this is his, this is his, uh, his route. Now, I, I do want to mention, uh, he, he traveled at his own expense, uh, and that was for the next 100 years, that was the case, the lower 100 years, we'll talk about that. But um, he took an earlier trip, Monroe was one of those land poor Virginia planners, or cash poor, land rich, cash poor. For his first tour of the East, if you remember, the uh, British burned the White House during the War of 1812. Well, uh, during his first tour, they were restoring the White House, and Monroe actually sold his <coughs> personal furniture to the government to uh, refurnish the rebuilt White House in order to, f to pay for his trip. But on this trip, he, uh, he came to Kentucky, as you can see, he spent almost a month here. Um, came in uh, southern border near uh, 
Russellville and Bowling Green and went north. Uh, Monroe was a very popular president in Kentucky for several reasons. He had, uh, he was in the Continental Congress. He had supported use, usage of the Mississippi, uh, which was a big issue for Kentuckians. Kentuckians needed to use the Mississippi to ship their, their products south. Um, he also supported Kentucky statehood. He was kind of a favorite son, even though he was from Virginia. He's always a friend of Kentucky. So everywhere he went in Kentucky, he got he drew crowds. And we'll tell you that on the route from uh, Russellville to Corridor, Indiana, was um, roughly where I-65 is now. Pretty vacant land. So he and General Jackson, who were traveling together through Kentucky, uh, when it came time to bed down for the night, they had to stop at the nearest place there was. So it was not unusual for them to stop at a, at a family's home and ask to spend the night. Now, can you imagine that? <laughs> the President of the United States showing up at your door <clears throat> to spend the night. But, but, uh, but that's, that's, the way, that's the way he traveled. Um, he told his, uh, when he left Washington, he told his staff, anything important that I need to see before I get back, send to Lexington. So he knew he was going to be in Lexington. Um, and he made it there for July the 4th. Um, it's, uh, it also, he came to Lexington because he had some personal business. He owned a large amount of land in Campbell County and Pendleton County. He was a, a speculator. And while he was in Lexington, he sold that property. Um, when he began his trip, he intended to come north to Cincinnati and go west to, and, and uh, by the river, go to St. Louis and down to New Orleans, and then take a boat back to D.C. But when he got to Lexington, he was ill. He'd been, on the, he'd been on the road for three months through the wilderness. He was tired. So what he did instead, he went to Harrodsburg. Um, you may know in Harrodsburg there were health, health springs, uh, mineral springs, where wealthy people from really all over the south came to, re, to rest during the summer. Monroe went to Harrodsburg, rested for, for about a week, um, and then came back to Virginia uh, through the uh, through the Cumberland Gap, and, and made it back to Washington uh, in early August. But that was the that was the fir first presidential trip. Of course, it was the longest presidential trip through Kentucky, and uh, quite a, quite an interesting uh, journey. Uh, Andrew Jackson also came to Kentucky. Uh, of course, he came four times uh, from Washington to his home in. Uh, in Nashville while he was president. On three of those occasions, he, he passed through Kentucky, twice on the Ohio River. He never came to northern Kentucky, but he did come down the river. Jimmy traveled in the summer. Uh, traveling down the Ohio River in the summer during those days uh, was tricky. Uh, on many occasions, there was not enough water to, where a steamboat could float. Uh, so he had, so uh, he had to pick and choose how he traveled on the river. In 1830, he came down. Unfortunately, once he got past Maysville, uh, the shaft on his steamboat broke. He was adrift in the river. This is the President of the United States. <laughs> adrift in the river. He was rescued by a party from Cincinnati who came up to meet him. And they, that, so they took, him, they took him back to Cincinnati. Um, Andrew Johnson also came to, Ohio, to Cincinnati. But the first president to come to northern Kentucky as you might suspect, is Ulysses S. Grant. Um, presidents came for all kinds of reasons, but Grant, as far as I can tell, is the only president who came to visit family because his family lived in Covington. His father on the left there, Jesse Root Grant, uh, moved to Covington in the early 1850s and bought the house uh, on uh, Green Up Street on the right there. You, you may know where it is. Uh, on, uh, between 5th and 6th Street on Greenup. I had to live in the house two years when I first, when I first moved to Covington. It's a <coughs> neat, neat experience. But anyway, um, Grant came to, uh, came to Kentucky three times while he was president to visit with his family. Um, Jesse Root Grant uh, was postmaster of, of Covington, uh, President Johnson appointed postmaster in 1966 in order to curry favor with Grant. He always, he needed Grant's support. He always courted Grant, uh, not with much luck. 
but he was a unique, uh, Jesse Rugram was kind of a controversial figure, a very colorful figure in Covington. Um, but he, he wanted to dabble in politics. He kept getting in his son's way. And you know, uh, uh, that's been a problem with presidents through the years. Their families have always gotten involved and caused trouble. Jesse Reed Grant did that because um, he kept trying to make money off the government, uh, as, as happens. Uh, he tried to get involved in, in presidential appointments. <coughs> and uh, he caused trouble for his son uh, all, all during his presidency. Now, Grant, the first time he came was in 1871 to visit his family, the president. And uh, he came to Covington on a, on a uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, when, he, when he stepped foot on uh, in Covington, there was a 21-gun salute from the Newport Barracks. It was a very active military post at that time. And the president went directly to the Schinkel, Amos Schinkel Mansion. You can see the building there, beautiful. 33 Gothic, 33 room Gothic uh, mansion, which sits where the Booth Hospital was. Many of you may know where that was on 2nd Street. Amos Schenkel, this picture on the left, was the wealthiest man in the area, philanthropist, responsible for the building of the uh, Roman Suspension Bridge, he financed it. And he, he built a mansion. Eventually, by the way, eventually this mansion uh, uh, was given to the Salvation Army. It became, the, in 1914, it became the first Salvation Army general hospital in the country. Mm. Fortunately, it was torn down and, uh, and the new hospital was built. It, it didn't serve very well as a hospital, obviously. But anyway, the <coughs> president went to the, uh, stood on the steps of the, of the uh, mansion and received all the locals. They had a big parade for him. Uh, came down, came down from Fifth and Scott. Great march down. They hung, they hung lanterns all up and down the street. It's a pretty, pretty big occasion. Uh, Grant politically was not very popular in in this area. Uh, never fared well in his elections when he ran. This area did not did not vote for him. But they did, they did give him a really warm welcome. And he was not a big big time speaker, he didn't like to speak very much. But he did say a few words to the crowd. He was, he was, he was an army general, he was not a, not a politician. And, uh, but he told the, told the crowd he appreciated them coming and he appreciated the fact that both Republicans and Democrats were welcoming. And then he went into the, headed into the mansion and they had a reception for him. And, and uh, he spent the night at, one night in Covington, didn't spend the next night in the Burnett House and went back to, to uh, Washington. He came again in 1872. His father had had a stroke, uh, was not doing very well. His father sent him a message asking him to come home. Didn't think he was going to make it very long. So Grant uh, and his son did come and, and visit his father, who was still postmaster and refused to resign, even though he could not do the job anymore. But uh, uh, <coughs> Grant came over, tried to smooth out that situation. Uh, Jesse Root Grant died in 1873, and the president came back for his funeral. That was the third and final time he came. Uh, the funeral was from was from the house. Uh, his, he was uh, uh, the visitation was at the house. The funeral was in the Methodist church across the street, where the Grants attended. Still, Methodist church is still there. Mm -hmm. And um, Grant, uh, of course, a huge funeral. Thousands of people attended. Jesse Root Grant is, uh, you see the picture here, he has a distinction. He's only one of two men in American history who saw their sons inaugurated as president twice. The other one's uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. It's kind of a unique, unique historical footnote. But anyway, uh, Jesse Root Grant died. He was buried in Spring Grove Cemetery. After the funeral, the uh, president went back to Washington and uh, did not come back to Kentucky during his presidency. Uh, his successors uh, only passed through Kentucky, only passed through Northern Kentucky on the train. Of course, by that time the Southern Railroad had been built, that one had been built, so presidents did pass through. President Hayes passed through a couple of times, and uh, President Harrison. But the next president who really spoke in Northern Kentucky was Theodore Roosevelt. He visited Kentucky five times. 
Love to travel. Travel more than any other president up to that time. And I don't have a picture of him in Kentucky. This is not in Kentucky, but but that's what he, that's how what he looked like. Very commanding figure. A uh, very energetic figure. Uh, in 19 and two, um, he came he came to Kentucky, to Covington in 1900 for a big rally when he was running for vice president. 10,000 folks showed up. One of the biggest political rallies to that time, certainly. <coughs> Um, and he came back in 1902 on the train. Um, he was going south, but he stopped in Ludlow because a, a group had gathered there. And so he, he always, you know, when he saw a group, he stopped. So he stopped in Ludlow and made a speech. Local newspapers didn't cover it at all, but it was covered in the New York Times, and it's the only reason we know about it. Stopped at the Ludlow Depot that, of course, is no longer there. Um, he came again in 1903. Um, and stopped at, uh, at Walton. He was on the L&N Railroad at that time. He was on, at Walton at the, at the station and spoke. And that trip uh, was kind of unique because uh, he was a, it was a hunting trip. He wanted to go out west and hunt into Mississippi. And he, uh, he had some press with him. It was bear hunting. Well, when this went on a few days. No bears. Couldn't find any bears. You know, uh, he was getting frustrated. Press was reporting, no luck. Finally, he found a little bear. You know, he didn't shoot it, but he found it. And the press reported it. Well, he was very upset. The press was reporting that he couldn't, he couldn't catch a bear, but he got a little, this little thing. Newspaper, the New York Times reported it. Well, all of a sudden, little bears started showing up in toy stores in New York. And they started calling him, this is a teddy bear. <laughs> so that trip was probably more historically significant than many, but it was the, it was the result of the te uh, teddy bear was the result. Um, he came again uh, for his very last trip as president, 1909. <coughs> he came to a little town in Kentucky, Hodgenville. You all know what happened there, what's going on there. Have any of you been to the Lincoln birthplace? Okay. Incredible place. If you haven't been, you should go. It's, it's an incredible place. Uh, I, I think I've been there a bunch of times. Kind of spiritual, I think, really. Really. But, of course, where Abraham Lincoln was born. Well, the farm where Lincoln was born, uh, after they only lived there a few years and left because of property disputes, it went into foreclosure. And, and it was about to be sold to a whiskey company that was going to use water from the spring that the Lincoln family used to, buy, to make whiskey. A lot of people got upset about that. Not an appropriate use of the spring that gave birth to Abraham Lincoln, basically. So they started a national campaign, collected nickels and dimes and pennies from school children, uh, gold dust from Alaska miners, all this stuff, collected enough money to buy the farm, and, um, and also to bring the Lincoln cabin back. It had been a cabin that had been uh, toured around the country that purported to be the birth cabin of Lincoln. So they bought all that, <coughs> brought it back to build a memorial there. At that point, there was no memorial for Lincoln. That was before the Lincoln Memorial. So this was to be a, a memorial to the, to the president on that spot. And they asked President Roosevelt to come and lay the cornerstone. Um, of course, I said, this is his very last trip. He had a huge ego. You probably know if you've read much history. He was uh, very concerned that, you know, he only had a month left in office. His successor had been appointed. He was going on this trip. He was afraid nobody would show up. Nobody would care. So he kind of kept it, tried to keep it a secret. But uh, word, word leaked out. And when he got to Kentucky on the train, he came to Newport, the only railroad went across to Louisville. Crowds had gathered really all along. Even, even where there weren't many people, uh, little cabins, people had flags, they waved. <coughs> and he, was, he was thrilled. And he later said it was one of the, one of the best times of his presidency. Um, so, he, he got to, uh, um, so he got to Hodgenville. You can see him walking up. Walking up. He was just thrilled with, the, with his reception. You could tell 
on his face how, how thrilled he was. You can even see the cabin back there, a little cabin that's there. It's still there today inside the, inside the uh, memorial. Um, and uh, and all, the, all, the, all the people around, it, 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 unfortunately the weather had turned out muddy and, uh, and it was not, not weather-wise not a very good day. In fact, they had, when the train stopped in Louisville, they had to get, she, they had to get boots for all of them to wear because it was so muddy. But, and you can see a lot of some of the umbrellas. But, uh, but it's really one of the spectacular events of his administration and one, one he always remembered. Uh, his successor was William Howard Taft, uh, who, of course, lived in Cincinnati. And I'm, I'm going to tell you just a little story about Taft that had anything to do with North Kentucky. But um, in 1909, uh, President Taft made a trip down the Mississippi River. Uh, the Panama Canal had just opened. But unfortunately, the boats, after they went through the Panama Canal, couldn't come up the Mississippi. There was too many, too many places where the river was blocked. It was too narrow and not deep enough in spots. So Taft wanted Congress to give him money to deepen and widen the Mississippi so those boats could go through the Panama Canal and head on up the Mississippi River to uh, Middle America. So he was, he was out campaigning for this. Uh, and you know he was he was from a Taft family, long, very wealthy, very prominent. He attended school in Yale, spent a lot of time east. He was very very fine taste. I, mean, I guess is the way to say it. So he, he spoke first in Cairo, Illinois, made a big speech. When he left Cairo, it was <coughs> noon time, and they and they decided they wanted to provide lunch for him. He'd get on the boat. So the, so. It's, a group of citizens ran down and said, Mr. President, we have brought your lunch. Thank you. So they handed it to him. They handed him the lunch. It was a big, fat, baked possum. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that was a delicacy to those folks. Not, not uh, and, but he was very gracious, accepted it, you know, thanked them for it, told them he'd, oh, he'd, he really enjoyed it on the boat. So he takes it on the boat and leaves. Comes down the river to Hickman, Kentucky. Now this, if you've been to Hickman, this is as far west Kentucky as you can get. It's on the Mississippi River. Well, <clears throat> so he, he, he comes to Hickman, you can see the huge crowd. I mean, the, you know, this is the kind of crowd the president's got that day. And so he, uh, so he gets off of Hickman, makes a speech, gets ready to leave. And uh, the board ran up and said, Mr. President, how did you, or, well, when, I'm sorry, when he, got, when he got to Hickman and got off the boat, they asked him, how'd you enjoy your lunch? Well, being, a, you know, he had to eat that possum. <laughs> <laughs> but he told him, it was, it, it was so sad. He didn't get a bite of it. He didn't know what happened to it. He, probably the reporters ate it all. He didn't know, but anyway. So he made his speech. When he left, he ran up to him and said, Mr. President, it wasn't fair that you didn't get to eat that possum. We brought you another one. <laughs> so, somebody, I don't know what happened to that possum. I doubt if he ate it. But he did, Taft did come back to Northern Kentucky in 1911. For those of you that have been to the Capitol in Kentucky, you know the Abraham Lincoln statue that sits in the rotunda, where you rub his, you rub his foot, and his foot's a different color. Well, Taft came in 1911 and dedicated that statue. It was a new capital, and this is a picture of the ceremony. Uh, then he went on to the Lincoln birthplace, and it had been finished, so he did, so he did the dedication. Um, another, uh, and this is, a, this is a more local, a local story, but uh, following uh, President Taft, the next president who came to this area was Warren G. Harding. He was not a president you think of very much, you don't hear very much about him. But he, he uh, came to Cincinnati, for the purpose of celebrating the centennial of President Grant's birth. And you may remember a couple of years ago that they, they had some more ceremonies here and it was news that it was the bicentennial. Well, Warren G. Harding came down for the uh, centennial in 1922. Um, he didn't actually come on Kentucky soil, but he did float on Kentucky water. I mean, Ohio <laughs> River's ours, right? So this is a program from, the, from that event. Now, uh, it was a big event similar to the tall stacks. 
He organized all steamboats and went up the river to Point Pleasant, Ohio. If, you, if you've been there, Grant's, home, Grant's house is still there, birthplace and there's things there. So they organized a flotilla to go up the <clears> river. Uh, all the businesses were closed that day. Schools were out. Um, they encouraged everybody to go to the river, to the riverside on both sides of the river to watch all the boats and to see the president as he went up the river. Uh, tickets were sold. You recognize the Island Queen. Probably all heard of the Island Queen if you're familiar with it. Tickets were sold in the Island Queen, the Morning Star, were the two big, biggest boats. But there were a lot of other boats. Uh, the president was expected to go on the go up on the Island Queen and come back on the Morning Star. Well, the night before the the night before, his uh, security people decided they weren't real comfortable with the president getting on a boat with 2,000 people who had been partying all day and were, were ready for a good time. Not. Not the best idea. So they decided to switch him to the Cayuga. This is a picture you can't see very well, but this is a picture. It's down the landing, Cincinnati, getting on the getting on the Cayuga. And they led the party. And it was a wise decision because halfway up the river, they were doing fireworks on the side. Folks on the Island Queen ran to the side of the boat to see the fireworks and the deck collapsed, the top deck collapsed. There were a number of injuries, some serious, so it's fortunate the president was not on that ship. Uh, but uh, it was ill-fated, of course, the Island Queen later that year uh, burned while it was in dry dock in Cincinnati. That was the first Island Queen. Uh, they replaced it with another one, of course, that burned in a spectacular fire later, but that was the uh, Harding visit. And of course, President Harding uh, was also ill fated. He died the next year uh, while on a trip out west. Uh, Herbert Hoover, uh, of course, he's a Calvin Coolidge didn't come. Herbert Hoover came through on a train. But the next president to speak in uh, northern Kentucky was Franklin D. Roosevelt. Now, this picture actually, uh, Roosevelt came five times to Kentucky. This picture actually is taken in Harrodsburg. Uh, if you've been to Fort Harrods State Park in 1934, this is the, uh, this is the dedication of a memorial there. Uh, the president came, and you can see Eleanor Roosevelt is with him in the car. Uh, president Roosevelt liked to travel by train, and that's what he did most of the time. He's the last president really to travel by train uh, very much. But uh, Mrs. Roosevelt uh, preferred to fly, so she, so she flew in and joined him here. Um, but you can see this is the kind of crowd they grew. This is at Harrodsburg. It's the kind of crowd the president would, would uh, draw at that time. Wasn't any TV. Uh, there was no way to connect much with the president. So when he came to the area, uh, you, got a, you got a crowd like this. He also came in 1936 to uh, that, that Lincoln birthplace. But his major trip to Kentucky, and I think one of the, one of the most historic trips you know, that the president made to, to Kentucky was in 1938. Um, you can see that this is at the uh, Latonia racetrack. And um, the reason he came in 1938, the New Deal, as we all know, was, was uh, somewhat floundering. There was political opposition had grown. He was getting, uh, the Supreme Court was not cooperating. He's having trouble getting his program through Congress. The majority of the at that time was Alvin Barkley, who was a Kentuckian. Roosevelt had to have him in the Senate to get his new deal through. He absolutely had to have him. And it was Alvin Barkley's on the right there. He was up for re-election in 1938, and Roosevelt had to make sure he got re-elected. Well, the problem was, the man in the middle, who was the governor of Kentucky at the Happy Chandler at that time. Very young, as you can tell, uh, very charismatic, extremely popular. He wanted to be a senator. His term as governor was getting ready to end. He had one more year. At that time, governors couldn't succeed themselves, so he was going to be out of office. He wanted to be the senator. 
President Ro and, and you tried to get the other U.S. Senator to resign, he wouldn't. So, President Roosevelt called President Roosevelt called Happy Chandler into the Oval Office and asked him, "Please do not run. I do, you cannot run. I need I need Alan Barkley." Roosevelt decided to run instead. He told the president, "No, he was running." So, as a result, President Roosevelt did something that was pretty unprecedented at that time. He got involved in a Democratic Party primary. You know, pre presidents just didn't do that. They didn't get involved in their in their own primaries. They tried to stay above that. So he announced he's coming to Kentucky and he's going to make a speech, or he'll make a series of speeches, three speeches actually, on behalf of Alan Barkley to make sure the people of Kentucky send him back to Washington. So his first speech was in in Latonia. Well, when uh, Roosevelt was on the train, came to, came to Cincinnati, uh, Union Terminal, y'all know, Indian Terminal, to change, to he had to change trains in order to come into Kentucky there. Well, who was there to meet him but Happy Chandler? Now, Roosevelt was speaking against him. And so, but uh, Roosevelt said, he's quoted as saying, Happy Chandler is more gall than any other politician I've ever met. <laughs> because he got, when, when, the, when the car got to Latonia that was going to take Roosevelt and Barkley to the, to the rally, Chandler jumped in the middle of them. <laughs> now, Chandler later said that, uh, he, that uh, Roosevelt invited him to do that, which, which, which everybody knew was a lie. But, um, whoops, let's see. There's Roosevelt at the racetrack speaking. I think this is kind of a neat picture. Uh, of course, he, uh, he spoke and, and encouraged the people of Kentucky to, to reelect Barkley. Um, and Barkley spoke, but Chandler, of course, did not. But Chandler was sitting, sitting on the podium with them right, when they were talking about uh, when, when Roosevelt endorsed Barkley. But uh, Chandler really didn't care. Now, it so happens that as the campaign went on, uh, it was one of the dirtiest campaigns in the history of American politics. Uh, Barkley claimed that Chandler was using state resources, which he was, for his election. Chandler claimed that Barkley was using federal resources for his election, which he was. And as a result, Congress held hearings in uh, the Hatch Act was passed. And I was really familiar with the Hatch Act. It's really been in the news the last few years. It prevents uh, government resources being used in political campaigns. But that campaign caused this. Uh, halfway through the campaign, uh, Roosevelt uh, got sick. He was in the hospital. And he claimed that uh, Barclay had, was Barclay campaign had poisoned him. It was that, it was that dirty. But Barclay did win by, I think it was about 80,000 votes. A year later, the other U.S. Senator died, and Chandler was appointed to that seat anyway. So he had to be in the Senate anyway. Uh, Roosevelt came back to Kentucky a couple more times uh, once he passed through. But in 1943, he made what was considered a secret wartime trip, and he stopped at Fort Knox to uh, look at how the troops were being trained. And I just thought this was an interesting picture. The troops gave him a model tank. Kind of a fun picture. And that's the governor. It looked, it looked pretty young. The, 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 uh, the next governor of Kentucky, King Johnson, uh, admiring the tank. So I thought that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, and after following that uh, 1938 trip, it was quite a long time until the president uh, came to <coughs> northern Kentucky. Now, I've asked this question before, and this is, at this point, it's a bad time to ask this question. But there is one spot in Kentucky where more presidents have been than any other place. One spot. Can you imagine what it is? Churchill Downs. No? No? <laughs> a good guess. No? Fort Knox. Yeah, that, no, that's right. Yeah, no, not Fort Knox. It's right. The Cincinnati Airport. Believe oh, it or not. Okay. <laughs> Believe it or not. Um, Ken, John Kennedy was the first president to land at CDG. But since then, it's been a regular spot. Uh, because 
during much of this, uh, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s even, Kentucky was a battleground state in presidential politics. And of course, Ohio, we know how important that was, or has been, continues to be. So this was really a, an area that uh, presidents liked to come because of the political influence that this area had. 1962, uh, Kennedy came. He actually came in 1960 to campaign. That was his first trip. Uh, when he was running for president, he came and, uh, and made a speech. Uh, of course, he's the first Catholic president, but he was not especially popular in this area because this area was so conservative. Um, when I was doing the research in this, on this uh, book, I uh, found there was, a, there was a letter from Ed Pritchard, who was the Kentucky um, political strategist. Guru. Yeah, that's right. Uh, he wrote a letter to, to, the, to the Kennedys telling them that you got to be careful in northern Kentucky because it is so conservative. The clergy is especially conservative, and they have a special amount of influence over the Catholic voters. So they were warning him. Uh, so Kennedy actually lost Kenton County, and, well, he actually lost Kenton Campbell and Boone County in the 1960 election to Nixon. Uh, they had hoped to carry Kentucky for the Democrats, uh, but, uh, but uh, Nixon actually won. But he came back in 1962 to campaign for uh, a Senate candidate. He was trying to win a Senate seat that was up. Uh, the incumbent Senator Thurston Morton was a Republican. Democrats were trying to knock him off. And he spoke for the uh, candidate uh, who was the mayor of Louisville, Wilson Wyatt. Well, Wilson Wyatt was pretty liberal compared to most Kentuckians. So Kennedy had a really tough job to sell. But he came, you can see at the airport, there were about 4,000 folks there, according to local news. You may recognize, there are some figures on the, on the podium there that you may recognize, and I can't see them very well, but uh, I did, rec somewhere Bob Aldemeyer is there, some of you may remember him, a local, a local county judge, but, uh, and there's some others there too, and the governor's there. But uh, the news reports say that the crowd was subdued and not as supportive. And there were demonstrators there who were protesting uh, the use of federal funds for desegregation in the South. But um, he spoke, uh, and then he went by motorcade in a white convertible through Covington and Newport to downtown Cincinnati where he held another rally. That one was a much bigger rally and people were much more supportive. And uh, the fact is he, uh, uh, the, his candidate did, did not win. A little bit too liberal for that day and that time. Uh, Kennedy, a week, but just to show you important, <coughs> he, how important he thought this was, a week later he came to Louisville and spoke, the same candidate. Kennedy had planned to come to Kentucky in December of 1963. In fact, following Dallas, that likely would have been his next trip to Kentucky. The New York Times had been reporting on uh, the uh, poverty in eastern Kentucky, and he had brought it to his attention. So he wanted to see firsthand what was going on. Unfortunately, uh, he was never able to make that trip. But his successor, Lyndon B. Johnson, did. This was in March or, uh, or April of 1964. Uh, Johnson came, sit on the porch, you can see him talking there to, uh, to a fellow on his cabin, you know, on the steps, Martin County, Kentucky. Uh, Johnson uh, had an idea of how bad the situation, had an idea of how bad it was. He didn't know for sure. He wanted to find out. He asked Lady Bird to come with him to make sure she saw, too, what was going on. Uh, pretty important trip. The result was his anti-poverty program, and a lot of the great society came out of what he saw on that trip. I included this picture. This was also, this was in Paintsville, the same trip. Believe it or not, four months before, Kennedy had been, or maybe six months, Kennedy had been assassinated. And look how close the people are to him. I don't see security anywhere. You know, this is Eastern Kentucky. How many of those people had guns? <laughs> but, um, but uh, and Johnson came back to Kentucky many, many times. But the one, the big trip, as far as Northern Kentucky is concerned, was Thomas More College in 1968. Um, 
Villa Madonna College had been in Covington since the, tw since the 20s. Uh, they bought the property where, where the college is now, moved out there, and it was rechristened Thomas More College. They invited the president to come and speak at the, re at the rechristening. Um, I, uh, some of you may know uh, Richard Jabot. Is that name? Yeah. Mr. Jabot. <coughs> well, uh, Mr. Jabot, Mr. Jabot was, uh, was a publicist for the college at that time, and he told me that they didn't know whether the president was coming until the last minute. You know, you invite him, he tentatively accepts, but depending on what's going on. So for this program, they, uh, they gave him an honorary degree. All the printings for the program were done twice. They did the local printing, and then they had an out-of-town firm do a printing in case the president came. They wanted to try to keep it secret. Uh, fortunately, he, he uh, spoke in Washington that morning, and that afternoon he was able to come. Got him, Got on the plane, that's when they knew he was going to be there. Uh, and you can see he spoke. Uh, he spoke. I have several pictures, uh, just uh, neat pictures. This is where when he arrived. Uh, these are from Thomas More's archives. The folks there weren't identified. I'm sure we could identify some of you. You may know some of them there. Uh, when, he met, he, when he arrived and met with the nuns, uh, pensive look. You know, I, I never was a big. Uh, I guess, uh, whoops, I, I, I never, you know, Johnson was uh, pretty young, I was pretty young when he was, when he was president. Uh, there he's on the plane afterwards, I thought it was kind of neat, meeting the college staff. Um, this was in 1968, and you know, things were pretty, pretty bad. We think things are bad now, but things then were pretty bad. You know, Vietnam was, was dragging on. Uh, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy had both been assassinated that year. Uh, the 1968 Chicago Convention had been held. The country was in, was in pretty bad shape. It was in the midst of a presidential election just a few weeks after this. Um, and I, I wanted to read you a quote from, uh, from his, his speech. I, you know, when, I, when I read the speech that he gave, um, his comments were, uh, he said, this is a small college from a small state that has produced so many big people with big hearts. He liked to brag about his Kentucky ancestors. His ancestors on both sides of his family were from Kentucky. Whenever he was in Kentucky, he always, always made that point. Um, he said, uh, his, his speech basically was a call for reason and moderation, and he asked the presidential candidates to act responsibly and honestly, which, you know, Certainly, we can say today too, same thing. But, but at that time, I think it was especially uh, poignant. Some people discovered a long time ago it is easier to scare people than to reason with them, which I thought was especially, especially a good comment. So I, uh, I thought more would make for I read that speech. Uh, let's see. Uh, Richard Nixon never spoke in Northern Kentucky, but he did come to Northern Kentucky to go to the 1970 All Star Game. So there he is. He's on his way to the All-Star Game. So David Eisenhower, who was his son-in-law, was with him on that trip. Uh, this is a, bad, a very bad picture, but uh, anyway, I wanted to show it. The, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, the only time he spoke in northern Kentucky, and this is in Carrollton, so it's a little bit of a stretch. He came to the airport here many, many times going to Ohio to campaign or to raise money. Uh, but he, he didn't speak here. But um, this was in 1998. He's in second administration. The big issue at the time was tobacco. Why are we going to go about tobacco? Was the government going to regulate it as a drug? Uh, were they going to keep paying farmers to grow it? What's the situation? Congress was debating a plan to buy out all the farmers. Um, and Clinton came to Carrollton to argue for support for that because Carrollton had one of the largest tobacco markets in the world. And only one county in Kentucky raised more tobacco than Carroll County. So he came to the high school to speak to try to convince those folks that it was in their best interest to accept the buyout. You know, tobacco companies were getting sued right and left because of the, what cancer was doing to folks' lungs. So 
he spoke trying to build support for that, and he was successful because Congress did pass the buyout. Farmers were paid to stop growing tobacco, and uh, and then uh, also uh, they made it illegal for youngsters to buy cigarettes. And so that was one of the one of the accomplishments of this administration. It was shortly after this that uh, the Lewinsky scandal broke loose, and this administration kind of kind of went out, went down. Um, George w, George W. Bush visited Kentucky more than any other president. Uh, partly because he was coming to Kentucky to go to Ohio. That was partly the reason. Of course, he owed his presidency to Ohio. Both his 2000 election and in 2004, had he lost Ohio, he would not have been president. So he owed a lot to Ohio. He campaigned there a lot. And he raised a whole lot of money there. Uh, he, uh, so he, but he, but he only spoke here on one occasion, 2006. He came to Northern Kentucky too. Uh, his administration was trying to advocate for uh, global business competitiveness. The business community he felt like was falling behind, need to be more competitive. And he chose, he chose NKU for that speech because NKU had a really good reputation at that time for uh, high-tech entrepreneurship, for building the skills for high-tech entrepreneurship. So he came to NKU. And he was pretty popular uh, in this area at that time. Uh, That's before the rise of the Tea Party and, and a more conservative Republican Party. But, uh, he was warmly greeted. His speech was in Regents Hall, so he may have been there for the, obviously before the new, or new arena was built. It would only hold 2,000 people. And, and so he spoke to an invited, invited guests, uh, pretty supportive, mainly the, the chamber types and, and Republican Party folks. But it's interesting that the speech that he had prepared and handed out to the press beforehand, he didn't give. Instead, he focused more on uh, explaining why the Iraq war was necessary. Mm -hmm. So he spent most of his time doing that, and then he talked some about uh, being, about, uh, being more competitive and, and being more, uh, more uh, global and not isolationist, which is kind of interesting in, the, in view of the way the politics have gone. He spoke at NKU, and then he went to the Hilton hotel in Florence, where he held a fundraiser for Congressman Jeff Davis. So you may remember the congressman that we had before, our current congressman. Je uh, in this area, it had a, 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 Jeff Davis was a one-term Republican, so Bush was trying to support him financially, and they raised $450,000 with that one day, which was, uh, which was successful. And Jeff Davis was reelected. Um, so, uh, and then we come to the to the the last the, the most recent visit. Uh, you know, I uh, Barack Obama came to Kentucky uh, on, on, on five occasions. He came to the airport on three of those. He didn't speak in Kentucky, but if you remember, he did speak. At the across the river, just across the river, with this bridge in the background, mm -hmm. but he spoke from the Ohio side. He was trying to get support for building the Brent Spence Bridge. Uh, he did not have much luck. Uh, he spoke from that hilltop, that side of the hilltop, uh, near the Bengal Stadium, which is just recently the city is bought. Um, and I thought when. Um, when Joe Biden became president, I thought, well, you know, he may be, he may be the, the president who doesn't come to Kentucky because, uh, you know, he's not, not especially popular here. He didn't, didn't get any votes here. And he's probably not going to spend much political capital trying to win Kentucky. But he actually has been to Kentucky more than a lot of presidents. He, he came to, of course, he came to Western Kentucky for the, to, to see the hurricane damage. He came to Eastern Kentucky for the flooding damage. And he's, been to, and he's been to Cincinnati several times, so he's actually been uh, much more than I expected, in particular for this visit. Uh, you know, 
I think most people in this room know that the Brent Spence Bridge has been a problem for um, 20, 25 to 30 years. A number of presidents have failed in efforts to get that bridge rebuilt. And it's become a political problem because uh, folks absolutely didn't want tolls. And the Kentucky legislature, in fact, passed a law that said that there would be no tolls on the bridge. Um, so uh, I think that, that was an important factor because when Joe Biden proposed his um, infrastructure and jobs bill, there really wasn't much chance of getting it through Congress with the Republican opposition, except for one thing. Mitch McConnell wanted that bridge as much as, as anybody. You know, for, for Mitch McConnell, who's, you know, he's, uh, been around a long time. His and we all know, his time is growing short in Washington, and he needed. He I'm sure he wants that one final big accomplishment, which is certainly this bridge. So when Joe Biden proposed his infrastructure bill, the one person, the one partner who could make it happen for him was Mitch McConnell, and I believe that's why. He came here uh, earlier this in January of this year and made his appearance on the Kentucky side rather than the Ohio side. Um, in his remarks, he was, uh, you can see uh, Mick McConnell there uh, with the president and uh, Senator Portman and Governor Bashir. Uh, when Biden made his remarks, he had the, the point of his remarks were uh, bipartisanship. Now, Biden wanted to make sure everybody knew his bill had gotten this bridge. He would gotten his bridge done, but his partner in doing it was Vince McConnell. So it shows that he can work across party lines to get things done. And I'm sure he's going to use this in his reelection. This will be one of the big factors he uses. And one of the reasons he wanted to be here. Now, uh, it's a beautiful day. I don't think they get a better January day. I thought they were kind of crazy trying to have it in January anyway. But um, they chose a site along the river where you could, where you had the beautiful, the beautiful view there of the bridge. And um, McConnell also made remarks. Um, his war is, I don't think his remarks were as generous as Biden's, generous towards Biden, as Biden's more towards, towards him. But that's the, each person has to do the political, has to play the political game from their viewpoint. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there's one final picture I want to show you. This was in, this was at the Kentucky Derby. Governor always has a Kentucky Derby breakfast. This was John Y. Brown, who was governor at the time, or Phyllis George, who were celebrities before they ever became governor. They held their Derby party in 1983. And you can see who. Who was who was there? Uh, see Donald Trump, Ivanka, um, uh, Mrs. Carter, and, uh, and uh, yeah, President Carter is there. He's just not in the picture. George Bush was vice president at the time. He and Barbara Bush were there. Who, can you tell who this is? It's Hillary. It's Hillary. Oh, it was her daughter. Yeah, this is Hillary. Hillary and, Hillary and Bill Clinton were there. So as far as I can tell, this is the only occasion when four presidents were together in Kentucky. So, yeah. But it's a, it a neat party. A neat party, can you imagine? Uh, the Trumps were there. The Bushes were there, the Carters were there, and the Clintons were there. That's a good point. That's right. So he, so he, uh, he had a, had a uh, star-studded derby party that year, 1983. Excuse me, Wayne. Yes. Who's the person in front of John Y. Brown? You know, I do not know. I don't it know. It looks like Armin Hammer, the rich oil man. Well, it could be. It could be. I don't know. I don't know who it was. I have asked some of those question before, and I haven't. I, I don't know. I always like to. I always like to hint that. One. Yeah. Any questions? 
We'll see who the next president is to come. Uh,